So I've shared with you, I think, before that Betsy and I live with these two knuckleheads. Henry is the brown one, and his sister Olivia is the black one. Not long ago, we were headed upstairs to bed, and when we got up to the top floor, the second floor of the parsonage, we, I noticed that these two were kind of hyper-focused on something right along the baseboard of the hallway. So I went to look and see what it was, and, and here the two of them had found a rather large yellow jacket that was crawling along the, the baseboard. Well, I, I dispatched that thing and didn't think much more about it until the next night. Betsy decided to go to bed a little bit sooner than me, and so she walked up the stairs, and I heard her walk through the hallway, and then all of a sudden, my name was called with some degree of energy. And I walked up into the bedroom, and there, here are two more yellow jackets crawling on the floor, and two more crawling on the bed. Huh. Now, you know, this time of the year, bugs tend to find their way inside, so... Okay, I, I get that, but we hadn't seen a yellow jacket in the house the entire summer, and now within 24 hours, I've seen five. Huh. So I dispatched those pretty quickly, but the next morning before I went to the office, um, I, I looked at the corner of our house where the siding meets the brick, and it's kind of up high, and right outside a particular spot, there was a cloud of yellow jackets. Oh. We have a hive in there. So I called Tom Holman and asked for a recommendation for somebody to come deal with it. And, and, and he gave me one and I called and the guy came out and, and put his ladder up against the, the, um, the wall and climbed up and said, wow, that's a really big hive because it's pushing the siding out from the wall. Okay, what do we do about it? He said, no problem, I got it. So he suited up and he crawled back up the, the, the ladder and he just pumped some, some white powder inside, these, uh, inside this spot. And then he said, it'll take 24 to 48 hours for this, this stuff to work. Okay, that night Betsy and I went to bed. We had closed the bedroom door in case any one of these critters decided to get in. And when I opened the door gingerly, gingerly there were bugs flying all around the bedroom. <laughs> so I closed the door and we slept in the recliners that night. But I went up the next morning, and I opened the door. All those bugs were laying on the floor and on the bed dead. And I'm not talking four or five of them. I'm talking about the fact that there were so many of them, Betsy brought the vacuum cleaner upstairs to clean them up. And then when we went downstairs into the garage, Betsy opened the garage door, and there on the garage floor, there was like this covering of white-dusted um, yellow jacket, so much so that she swept them up, and I have a really big dustpan, and she filled that dustpan up completely with dead yellow jackets. Now, why do I share all that with you? Well, to simply say this, you know, I could have gone day after day after day just dispatching those yellow jacks, one here, two there, four or five in this spot, but the individual bugs weren't the problem. You with me? It, it was the hive that was the problem. And the hive needed to be eliminated. The fundamental root problem needed to be identified. And once that was done, once that root problem was identified, then the battle plan was able to be formed and put together. Okay, keep that in mind. You have to identify the fundamental root problem before you put the battle plan together if it's going to work. Now, I wonder if that process says anything or connects it all to the culture that you and I are living in today. I wonder. If you don't already know, we live in this culture that is all about drawing battle lines. Right? It's you against me, me against you. I'm for this, but not for that. You're wrong and I'm right. That's the culture we live in today. And we engage life from the poles. We engage life from the opposites. And we end up thinking that that, that that is where the real battle is. And what that's created in us is a culture of antagonism. 
a culture of confrontation, a climate of confrontation in our culture right now. Are you with me? You, you, you get it? And here's the thing. In the midst of that culture of antagonism and that culture of confrontation, you know what's happening? The evil one is grinning from ear to ear. I can almost hear the evil one saying, as long as I can keep them at each other's throats, people will not connect to Jesus and find the healing and the hope that is in His name. See, here's the truth, sisters and brothers. We are in a battle. You're in your battles. I'm in my battles. We're in a battle as a church. The culture is in the midst of a battle right now. Amen? But the battle is not me against you and you against me. The battle is against the very real forces of evil that's operating in the spiritual world and that we face every day. And that battle, those forces are convincing us that the real fight is against each other. The real fight is with the people that disagree with us. The people that see things differently than we do. But that's not the truth. The battle is against the evil one. It's a spiritual battle. It's not a physical one. Come back to where we started. Once you identify that, once you know that to be true, then the battle plan can be formed and put together on the basis of that. This is how the Apostle Paul says it. This is Ephesians chapter 6. He says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground and after you have done everything to stand. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all of this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Put on the helmet of salvation and take the sword of the Spirit which is the Word of God. And pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert. and Keep on praying for all of the Lord's people. Amen? Amen. So I want to spend a little bit of time the next few weeks with those eight verses of Scripture. Because I think that what Paul does in those eight verses of Scripture is put our life our culture, our our place right now into perspective for us. Because what Paul says is, look, what we're facing, what we're fighting against, is not really our kindred. It's not our sisters and brothers. It's not flesh and blood, he says. We're fighting against designated chiefs. That's what the word rulers means. We're fighting against forces of influence. That's what authorities mean. And we're fighting against those things that are all emissaries of the evil one. And and, and these chieftains, these forces of evil, they're not from the natural world. They're supernatural. They are wicked. They operate in this realm that is kind of beyond our normal lives. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, boy, our pastor's kind of gone off the deep end a little bit. Because after all, that whole thinking, what I just shared with you, seems counter to human logic, counter to to human reason. I mean, there have to be some logical answers, some logical reason why the culture is in the state that it's in right now. Consequences of choices that you and I have made and other people have made. The the fact that the culture seems to be focusing more on power and and position in a self-centered way. 
Those, the idea that there is some kind of a force that's beyond us working in the world that's, that's there to do us harm, that's just beyond human logic, human reason. It's kind of out there a little bit. But here's the thing. For Paul... That there is an enemy intent on waging war against us is beyond doubt. And, more importantly, that there is a God that we serve that is mighty in power and makes Himself that power available to us through the power of the Holy Spirit. That, too, is beyond doubt. That's why Paul says to you and to me, put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. That that word to put on literally means to put clothes on, to clothe yourself so that you can take your stand. That phrase means to stand your ground against the devil's schemes. Now watch this. When you and I put on the armor of God, we are putting on the power of God. And that means that with the power of God in us and at work through us, we can stand our ground. The enemy is supernatural. And because the enemy is supernatural, we have to approach it in that way. The battle plan has to reflect that. On the battlefields that we're in, EID is critically important. Enemy identification. It's, it's, you have to be clear about the enemy because that determines the plan for dealing with the battle. It's just like it was with the bees. The fundamental problem needs to be identified. And once that is identified, then the battle plan can come together. I was thinking a little bit about that this weekend. I thought, you know, I wonder, I'm, I'm not a veteran didn't serve in, in uh, the service as much as respect and love as I have for those. And so I, I started to question, I wonder, in, in terms of military things, how do you identify an enemy in military terms? Or, or maybe when you're a policeman or a policewoman, how, how do you identify where there might be an enemy? And, and of course, not knowing this, I decided to ask one of our veterans, who's also a retired policeman, Dave Titley, if he would respond to those questions. And here's what he said. Here, here's how we begin to identify some enemies. The first thing he said is, if something looks out of place, there might be some enemy involvement there. And he showed me this picture of a retirement community in Sarver that is known to have million-dollar condos in it. And right outside one of these condos, there was this van that was painted in flat black, including all of the windows. Do you see how that looks out of place? In a place like that, that's a retirement community with million dollar condos, a van like that just looks out of place. So you begin to wonder about that. They've said that if you're observing somebody and a person really looks always on edge, or they're always surveying their surroundings. There might be something to be suspicious of there. <laughs> and, and David said this, if you find somebody rooting through your trash, it might be an enemy. <laughs> yeah. And then this one I thought was interesting. If the community that you're part of doesn't look normal anymore, That if the community you're part of looks like it's starting to change. If it's too quiet. He used the image of when he served overseas and going into a community, into a little town. And all there was nothing. There was no people. There was no action. There was no sound. When you walk into a place like that, he says, there may be an enemy at work in that spot. So I, I started to ask the Holy Spirit to build some bridges between what he was saying and and what we're talking about here. And and, and I think the Spirit gave me a couple images. You know, the evil one could be at work when you find yourself cranky and on edge. Now, none of you are ever that way. Hello? You're never that way, right? 
Nobody's cranky. Nobody's on edge anywhere, right? I mean, it's somewhat normal, right? But here's what Paul said. The kingdom of God is a matter of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. So if you discover that the peace and the joy has evaporated from your life, if you are hyper-focused on the battle that's in front of you, instead of the one who is equal, more than equal to the battle, you know, the enemy might be at work in the midst of you being cranky and being on edge. How about this? The evil one could be at work when your trash haunts you. (laughs) What I mean by that? How many of us at some point in time in our life have taken mistakes and failures and things that we've asked forgiveness for and we've put them into the hands of Jesus and all of a sudden at one particular point in time all of those things that we have asked forgiveness for come flooding back into our minds and they begin to control our attitudes and they begin to control uh, our relationships with other people. Am I talking about myself or is anybody else out there? You know what I mean? That's your trash. The enemy might very well be at work if all the stuff that you've already asked Jesus to take care of is all of a sudden occupying your mind again. The enemy might be at work. The evil one might be at work when the community that you're part of starts to change. When the fruits of the Spirit are being replaced by fleshy things. Let Let me remind you of the difference between those two. This is Paul in Galatians. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit. And the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other. So that you are not to do whatever you want. Now here are the acts of the flesh. Listen to this list. Sexual immorality. Impurity and debauchery. Idolatry and witchcraft. We hear those and say, yep, got it. But look what else Paul includes in the acts of the flesh. Hatred. Discord. Jealousy. Fits of rage. Selfish ambition. Dissensions. Factions. And envy. Drunkenness. Orgies. And the like. And Paul says this, I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. And then he says, since we live by the Spirit, let's keep in step with the Spirit. Let's not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. Remember, you got to identify the enemy. you got to be clear about the enemy. Because that's going to determine the battle plan. And when the, when the enemy is supernatural, then the battle plan needs to match that. It needs to, it needs to connect with it. So what are some weapons that you and I might be able to use when it comes to battling in a supernatural way? As as I prayed about that, the one that came to my mind with power is the supernatural power that is released when you and I choose to love regardless of the situation. When When you and I choose to love the way Jesus did, man, that releases power within a situation. Here's the thing. The enemy, the evil one, would have us respond to the things that happen to us in the same way as the things that happen to us. Right? The enemy would have us respond to hatred with hatred. The enemy would have us respond to hurt with hurt, to wrongdoing with wrongdoing. The enemy would have us respond to discord with more discord, to divisions with more division. That's what the evil one would want to do because he keeps each other, he keeps us at each other's throats that way. But if we choose not to respond that way, if we choose instead to respond with love and grace and mercy, the power of the cross of Jesus Christ is released into those places. A power that meets hurtful and negative things with the power of Jesus' love. Remember what he said in John chapter 13? A new command I give you. Love each other as I have loved you. Love each other 
as I have loved you. And then he says this, and I love this part. By this. By what? By the way you love each other. By this. People will know that you are my disciples by the way that you love each other. And, and if you know something about John chapter 13 where that verse is recorded, you discover that he says this right on the heels of the, the time that he washed the disciples' feet. And who was around the table when he washed their feet? Judas, who was about ready to sell him out. And Peter, who just a short time later would say that he didn't, doesn't even know Jesus three different times. Can I tell you this? Jesus did not say, love those you agree with. Jesus didn't say, if you disagree with somebody, you don't have to love them. What he said was that people are going to know that you follow me by the way that you love each other. And watch what happened. When you and I meet the hurt and the struggle and the hatred and the discord, when we meet that, even when it's hard, with love, it causes the power of the enemy to grind to a halt. Why? <laughs> Are you ready? Because the power of evil doesn't know what to do with sacrificial love. The power of evil has no answer to sacrificial love. And when evil is confronted with sacrificial love, even death turns away. I told you last week that one of my absolute favorite movies is the movie Gladiator. Can I tell you about another one? One of my other favorite movies is the, the movie setting of C.S. Lewis's Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe. Anybody see that one? Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe? Yeah, a few of you. So there's a scene in that movie that is just so powerfully profound. Aslan, the great cat, the Christ figure in the movie, has been killed. And he's laying dead on the stone table. So as you watch this, pay attention to what happens to the stone table. Isn't that a great clip? Pay attention to the table. See what happened to the table? Can I suggest to you what it means? The table intact with Aslan laying on the top of it is the cross. The table cracked with Aslan gone is what? The empty tomb. Hallelujah. Can I suggest something to you that the, there is no more powerful image or reminder of the sacrificial love that has power than the cross of Jesus Christ. No other reminder is any more powerful than that. This is World Communion Weekend. We gather at the table with brothers and sisters in Christ across this globe, literally. Now, they, they talk different than we do. Their culture is different than our culture is. But here's the thing. In every culture and in every language, the cross means exactly the same thing. When... A willing victim who has committed no treachery dies in a traitor's stead. Even death itself turns away. Whew. So I wonder, I started to think about my own life. And I said, where in my own life do I need to hang a cross so that I can remember the power of sacrificial love? in the battles that I face? Where do I need to hang a cross to remember that when it comes to sacrificial love, the power of evil has no answer? And that that power is always going to triumph. Where, do I, where in my life do I need to hang a cross? Is, is it maybe in the place where you work? You need to hang a cross in the place of employment for you somewhere? Maybe you need to hang a cross in your family room to remind you in all of the relationships that are important in your life, the power of sacrificial love will win every battle. I don't know how to do this, 
But maybe you need to hang a cross in your social media feeds. When you're just about ready to post that thing. When you're about ready to comment about something and return kind for kind. Maybe you need to hang a cross there. To remind you that power is not responding kind for kind. Power is in sacrificial love. Maybe you need to wear one so that you'll be reminded wherever you go, you know, I'm not very bright, so I have to wear one, and then I carry one in my pocket too to remind myself that the power is in sacrificing out of love because the enemy has no response to it. I'll wrap it up with this. Do you know that God has a plan for your life? Would you say yes? Do you know that the enemy has a plan for your life too? Be ready for both of them. Just be wise enough to know which one to battle and which one to embrace.